Getting sick is the worst, but it happens to everyone, whether that be the common cold or flu or something more severe. Our immune systems are always hard at work to protect us. Our immune systems are complex compilations of many mechanisms, all working together to fight off pathogens. Since we all get sick from time to time, it is important that everyone understands exactly how our immune systems defend us from sicknesses. Today, we're here with little Timmy. Timmy was infected with the flu during one of his lectures from being in too close proximity to someone who was contagious. So, what happens now? How does Timmy's immune system react to and fight off this threat? Let's take a closer look. As the defenses of our bodies, the job of our immune system is to identify, stop, and remove anything that can cause disease, whatever they may be. The immune system is thought of as being made up of two parts, the innate and adaptive immune systems, that work together as a two-layer defense. Our channel has already explored the innate immune system and how this first line of defense rapidly identifies and separates pathogens into broad groups before targeting them. In this video, we'll be looking at the adaptive immune system, how it recognizes the specific pathogens that we are fighting, and how it protects us both now and from future infections. As our body's second line of defense, the adaptive immune system is generally called upon to deal with the threats that make it past the innate immune system. Unlike the more broad, more general, but also more timely response of the innate immune system, the response from our adaptive immune system is generally slower, but also one that is much more specific to the pathogen. It all begins at the site where pathogens are found. Here, cells such as macrophages and dendritic cells eat up the pathogen in a process called phagocytosis. The pathogens are then broken down into small bits before being loaded onto proteins of the major histocompatibility complex family, or MHC family. These proteins are then presented on the cell surface. We call any small fragment, piece, or part of a pathogen an antigen, and so this process is called antigen presentation, with the cells involved being named antigen-presenting cells. These cells then travel through the body to arrive at lymph nodes located all over our bodies. Within these lymph nodes reside a large number of T cells and B cells, the primary cells of the adaptive immune system. Due to their location in the lymphatic system, these cells are also called lymphocytes. Once in the lymph nodes, antigen-presenting cells are mostly responsible for interacting with T cells, which comprise the cellular part of adaptive immunity. T cells have a wide range of functions, but all possess an aptly named T cell receptor which can recognize antigens only when they are presented on MHC proteins. Each T cell produces only one type of T cell receptor that will only recognize one specific part of one antigen. The interaction also requires a co-receptor from the T cell, which serves as a way to distinguish the two major classes of T cells. The presence of a protein called CD8 denotes T cells as killers, which function to kill other damaged cells through various means. The presence of a protein called CD4 denotes T cells as helpers, which serve to specialize or to polarize the immune response towards a particular type of pathogen, as well as regulate the immune response through the release of various chemical messenger molecules known as cytokines. In a lymph node, most of the T cells encountered by antigen-presenting cells are called naive, because they have not yet encountered a specific antigen. The process of activating naive T cells is key to allowing them to perform their functions, and it begins with the binding of the T cell receptor and co-receptor to the presented antigens and receptors on the antigen presenting cell. If the T cell does not recognize the antigen, nothing occurs. But if the T cell does recognize the antigen, other molecules and receptors on both cell surfaces become involved, binding to one another in a process called co-stimulation. Here, Various activating and inhibiting signals compete and merge into an overall signal for the T-cell, and this will determine whether the T-cell will respond to this antigen in the future or not. Finally, throughout the process, various cytokines are needed to regulate, specialize, and maintain the T-cell. Despite the long response time, if these three processes go well, the T-cell becomes activated and will divide and make copies of itself before leaving to perform their effective functions. Killer T-cells will go out to the site where the pathogens are, finding cells presenting the antigen that it recognizes, and kill those cells. In Timmy's case, 
Cells infected by the flu virus would present bits of viral proteins, and killer T cells would remove those virally infected cells along with the viruses within. Helper T cells will remain behind, interacting with other immune cells and regulating their functioning. Similar to how T cells rely on antigen presenting cells, B cells, comprising what is known as the humoral part of adaptive immunity, rely on T cells to activate, and thus have an even slower response time. Like T cells, each B cell produces only one type of B cell receptor, which is shaped very much like an antibody. This receptor will only recognize one specific antigen. However, unlike T cells, B cell receptors can recognize free-floating antigens and does not require binding to MHC proteins. When a B cell binds to an antigen it recognizes, it internalizes the antigen and then loads and presents the antigen in a way behaving like an antigen-presenting cell. It then waits for an activated helper T cell to come and interact with it. The interaction, in many ways, is just like between any other antigen-presenting cell and a T cell. The T cell must recognize the antigen, provide co-stimulation, as well as exchange cytokines, but this time to help activate the B cell. Once activated, B cells multiply and then specialize to perform functions. Most B cells become plasmablasts and later plasma cells, initially secreting low affinity antibodies of a single class, before slowly improving its affinity as well as switching into other classes of antibodies that can bind to and aid in the fight against the pathogens. However, some also become what are known as memory B cells, becoming able to live for an extremely long time, as well as circulating the body in case the pathogen returns. With the adaptive immune system slowly coming online, Timmy is actually feeling a bit worse. But that's a good sign. Many common symptoms we experience during an illness, like fevers and coughs, are caused by the cytokines released by our immune system and indicates that the immune system is hard at work. Having recognized the flu virus, it won't take long before Timmy's immune system completely clears them out for good. At this point, having briefly covered how our immune system works to clear out an infection, I think it is worth revisiting some very interesting points. We've mentioned that each B and T cell produces only one receptor, and recognizes only one specific part of an antigen. Given how many antigens there are in a pathogen, and how many different pathogens there are, some of you may be wondering how it is possible for our immune system to recognize them all. The answer? Recombination. See, B and T cell receptors are actually modular proteins. Each module has many different variants encoded into our DNA. When making a receptor, the cell first randomly selects one variant of each module and cuts out any DNA in between. The modules of DNA are then glued together in an imperfect process where random bits of DNA can be added or removed. These two steps will ensure that it will be very difficult for you to find two naive lymphocytes with the exact same receptor. And given how many new lymphocytes our bodies make in a day, we can begin to see how the adaptive immune system can recognize anything thrown at us. Some of you may also be wondering that, since the receptors can bind to anything, wouldn't some cells make receptors that react to parts of our own body? And to that we say, you're right! When newly made, many B and T cells are known as auto-reactive and can bind to and damage our own bodies. Not only will our own cells be targeted, but the release of cytokines as well as the ensuing inflammation and immune response may cause a cascade of problems known collectively as a cytokine storm. However, all T cells undergo a maturation process in the thymus, and B cells undergo a similar process in the bone marrow, which weeds out most of these auto-reactive cells. Failure in this process can result in the damage and destruction of parts of our own body, leading to a variety of either autoimmune or chronic inflammatory diseases like type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. Over the course of the immune response, the adaptive immune system will slowly come online, bringing in large quantities of highly specific B and T cells to combat the pathogen. Assuming all goes well, the pathogen will eventually be cleared from the body and the immune system must now return to its original state. At this point, most active plasma and T cells will slowly undergo apoptosis, or programmed cell death, choosing to remove themselves entirely to prevent usage of more nutrients and the production of more unnecessary cytokines. Like veterans from a war long ago, the number of adaptive immune cells that are familiar with this specific pathogen will slowly decrease, but this number will never go down to what it was at before. 
On the T-cell side, some leftover cells will become memory T-cells, patrolling the body's tissues to look for any sign of a return of the pathogen. With B-cells, memory cells are made shortly after activation, but among the plasma cells that remain, there will always be a small number that live on and continue to produce antibodies. After Timmy's immune system worked to fight off the flu, his adaptive immune system now has the memory cells that will recognize this particular strain of the flu virus in case he contracts it again. If the pathogen does return, such as in a secondary infection, it will be these memory cells that activate and fight off the pathogen. The surface of these memory cells have been modified so that they respond more quickly. And so the activation process actually takes much less time to occur than the first time around, so much so that it sometimes merges itself with our innate immune system's response, turning our two-layer defense system into almost a single layer. Perhaps equally surprisingly, this process also generates a much stronger adaptive immune response than the first time around, because beyond a simple reactivation, memory cells also secrete cytokines and antibodies that inhibit the ability for naive lymphocytes to activate, thus leaving more resources for these more experienced and more pathogen-specific immune cells to multiply and remove the threat. And so, for every pathogen that makes it past our first line of defense, the adaptive immune system rouses itself to battle, fighting off the pathogens until death or victory, and then returns to its normally quiet but vigilant state, never forgetting what it had fought. It is important to know how our bodies react to and respond to the various pathogens that can harm us. In the midst of a global pandemic, now more than ever, we should all be educated and aware of why and how our immune system protects us. So take the time to get to know the part of you that protects you. And remember to take care of your immune system by taking care of yourself.